Welcome to Sociology One. So uh, this week's a little bit different. We're going to um, start a video today and watch most of it, but then on Wednesday is when that video will conclude. Uh, but the live students that are here won't be here on Wednesday because I won't be here. And we're having a, an on-campus event here that we're part of, and I'm encouraging all the students in here to come to that. And, uh, and maybe even earn extra credit by turning in a paper about it or um, or getting up to speak during our open mic. And that, by the way, applies to you at home, too, if you want to come out of your caves or wherever you watch the, the class and come down to Yuba College and be part of our uh, October Voter Fest here. From 2 to 5 p.m. in the theater is when the, um, is when the speeches will happen. And we'll have a sign-up sheet there if people want to sign up to speak. And it doesn't have to be about the election. It could be about any issue you think you want the community to hear about, whether it's a national issue, local issue. Uh, your own personal issue, whatever. It's a free speech. It's an open mic. Um, but there will be a lot of candidates there speaking, uh, uh, local candidates talking about why they're running and why you should elect them. And there'll be quite a few other speakers, including members of the debate team and speech team here and people like that. 
Uh, so I invite you to come down and you too, you guys, uh, I'm not going to monitor whether you actually come to the event, but I hope, you, well, maybe I should. I think I will. I'm going to have a sign-in sheet for Sociology 1 at the theater at 2, starting at uh, 2 o'clock uh, when it starts, but you can get there at 2.30 if you want. And I won't have, a monitor, won't have a way to monitor how long you stayed, but I hope you will decide to stay. And you can get extra credit if you stay long enough and write up a paper, or just by presenting on the open mic, I'll give you extra credit. So, and all of that is about the future of this country and the future of this community. If the national election is not that exciting for you, or if it disgusts you, or whatever it does for you, um, I find, personally, and when I was your age, I wish I knew this, uh, at your stage, I should say, in college, because I wasn't very involved in college in politics. I watched the debates and stuff like that. But being involved in your local community, getting involved in right here in your own neighborhood, how do you make this a better, you know, never mind making America great again, if you could make your own street better than it is, or in your own neighborhood, your own town, your own county, then I think that's going to make you feel like politics is a lot more interesting and exciting. When it's something far removed and it's people with power we've never heard of talking about stuff we don't really understand, then who can really care about it? But when it's talking about like, how do we make Yuba College better? How do we make this class better? That's politics too. And my concern about today's young people is you don't seem to try to make things better. You, ex you sort of sit there thinking your other people are going to do it. And maybe that's a failure on the part of we teachers is we haven't encouraged young people enough to see themselves as the change makers who can make things happen and you know call attention to problems so that's another plea don't just come and listen to what other people have to say about what the problems are and what can be done about them maybe come to the voter fest with the idea that you can have a voice you have eyes you can see what's wrong with things and try to call attention to them and ideas about how to make things better. So anyway, uh, but local, my main point there was when you focus on your own life, it's, it's easier to care about the politics of it. When it's far away and it's distant and it's famous people, then it doesn't seem like it really matters to us. But anyway, we are uh, focused on um, gender right now and race. We're trying to talk about those two things together. This Election is certainly about gender and race. It's also about class more and more. I think we can understand that. But we are focused on gender. And so gender, from a symbolic interactionist standpoint, as we've already made this point, gender can be seen as performance, as a mask that people put on, uh, and a, a costume they wear, and a, a role they're pretending to play. And in that sense, you know, there's masculine costumes you can put on, there's feminine ones. My child at home, he's three years old, you could say he's sort of pre-gender. He hasn't really decided which thing he wants to be, masculine or feminine yet. And uh, he, we have costumes at the house. Sometimes he'll throw on the princess costume. Sometimes he'll throw on the Iron Man costume. Sometimes he'll throw on the Spider-Man costume. But in his mind, it's fun to pretend to be something. And at this stage in his life, it's fun to pretend to be all kinds of things. And as adults, maybe we start learning that only certain kind of costumes are going to get us rewards in society, or we might be made fun of for other kinds of performances, but that's uh, what it means to construct gender. And, uh, and so anyway, this video looks a lot more at this idea, and it's called Tough Guys. If you're here in the classroom, I don't know if you can see at home, the video title's on the screen here. It's spelled G-U-I-S-E, which is a play on words. Obviously, it's referring to guys. But it's really talking about a guise. What's a G-U-I-S-E? And how is that different from G-U-I-S? Disguise. Disguise. So a guise means a costume or a mask. And, but it's talking about guys, meaning boys. Usually when we hear we're going to talk about gender in a class, you might think that women's issues are going to be the big topic of discussion. But uh, in my own mind, women's issues aren't really the big issue right now. And I want to put it this way, because we've talked about it before in this class. You can focus on the structure of a society or a community or a group, or you can focus on its culture, or you can focus on both at the same time. Structure is a question, as we've said, of who has what. So when it comes to gender equality, 
A lot of us focus on this side of the equation. When we talk about who has what, we're talking about things like money and jobs and political power and opportunities and things like that. And when we talk about gender equality, we could certainly be measuring these things and asking, well, how equal are women to men today? And certainly, you know, when I was in college, they used to say women made about 57 cents for every man's dollar. So for the same work, women would earn 57 cents an hour and men would earn a dollar an hour or, or that the equivalent thereof in units. Nowadays, they say women were earn something like 87 cents to every man's dollar. So you could say that structurally, women are more equal to men than they used to be, and they certainly are in terms of income. So we say money, income is one thing to measure. How much do you make a year? And in terms of income, you should be taking notes on this, not staring off into space. Some of the same people that, so anyway, remember this class is based on my lectures. We just took a test. A lot of you didn't pass it. If you weren't taking notes and you're not taking notes now, you're not doing the steps you need to take to, to pass the class. So we don't just sit here. You don't get any credit just for sitting here since I'm not taking role. You get credit for learning what I'm saying. So what I'm talking about is the difference between structure and culture. Structure, and it's a difference I've brought up a lot before, but people didn't quite get it, so I'm going over it again. And I'm relating it to gender. Structure, if you're looking at a society or group or America, we can ask, well, who has what in America? And if we're comparing men and women, men have more than women in terms of their income, their wealth, how much money do they have stacked up? We've never had a female president until maybe November 9th. So you could say in terms of power, men have more than women do. But there's been a lot of gains. So we couldn't say that in terms of equality, women are much more equal to men than they used to be in terms of structure. Um, there's still, and this is a key term from your book, there's still a glass ceiling, meaning the top, the very top positions in America are where men still hold a lot of the power. So like in colleges and universities, there's a lot of female professors today, but still not a lot of female presidents and chancellors of colleges and universities. If you're talking about countries, you know, some countries have female presidents. Ours still hasn't had, and so you could say Hillary Clinton's still trying to break the glass ceiling in America. But what, generally speaking, structurally we're better, more equal than we used to. And so that's a good reason to maybe focus on the cultural side of equality. Not who has what, but who thinks and feels what. Like, how do we talk to each other? How do we feel about each other? Who, when you walk into a room, who's the one with the power and authority and who isn't? These are more things that you can't necessarily have or not have, although I use power there. But I'm talking more about things like, you know, esteem. Well, for example, when somebody like a presidential candidate says, when he's a famous man, he can do whatever he wants to women in private. Well, he's saying, I have cultural power. I'm a man with status and some woman who wants my attention and power will let me do what I want to her. So it's uh, a cultural thing, but when it comes to culture, you know, we can ask about things like attitudes and beliefs and performances. Like, can a woman just wear whatever she wants in today's culture or not? Or can she present herself and perform any kind of femininity that she wants? We've talked about masculinity being more open in some ways. Well, but really, what I want to suggest is masculinity is in some ways in more crisis than femininity. When we're talking about culture, we're talking about masculinity and femininity, not so much who has what, like penises or vaginas, but the meaning of these things, the cultural meaning of penises and vaginas. And when it comes to masculine and femininity, you can say femininity has changed a lot because the structure of society has changed a lot. As women have made more money and gotten more power, the cultural meaning of having a vagina has changed. You're not as limited as you used to be. My mom and grandma, they could look at their sexual anatomy and figure, <coughs> well, that's what I got down there. Then I'm only going to be limited to certain things that I can hope to be. My grandma wanted to be a teacher, and that was pretty much if you were in her time, that was about as high status a job as you could get as a person with a vagina. My mom was able to go and you know, get a call, uh, other kinds of graduate degrees. She was able to climb up a little harder. She were, was a lab assistant at a university. Um, my daughters 
look at the world and say, there's nothing I can't be. If my, I have a vagina, but I could go be anything. My daughter's even talking about playing football right now. I'm like, don't do it, you'll get a concussion. But, um, so they don't see themselves as limited. What about people with penises, though? Because as the definition of femininity changes, you can say that the definition of masculinity changes, too, because they're locked in a binary opposition where one defines the other. So if femininity means much more today than it used to, what does masculinity mean? Um, for a lot of men, it means we're not sure what it means to have a penis anymore. Does it mean I'm supposed to be a big, powerful guy with a lot of money who mistreats people? Some men in our society are saying that's who should be president. Or should I be an African-American guy who's sensitive and treats people with respect and has daughters? I mean, that's our current president. So just if you think of the president who's currently president and the candidate who's running to replace him, and you think of young men today looking at possible role models, it uh, might be a little confusing as to who should I try to be? What, what will be respected in America? What do people look up to? What would be the right way to be a good man in American life today? And we seem to be asking that question even more than we're asking, what does it mean to be a good woman in American culture today? So when I look to the future, I'm a little more worried about my sons and their ability to forge a clear identity of how to act because of, of what's between my legs, um, more than I'm worried about my daughters. And this movie takes up that question, Tough Guys 2. It's taking account more of the culture of gender what, is it, how, what, do we, what does it mean to have a penis in America? How are you supposed to act? How are you supposed to present yourself? How are you supposed to dress? How are you supposed to talk? How are you supposed to relate to other people? What kind of jobs are you supposed to want to get? These are all part of all ways that we construct masculinity. And according to this video, masculinity is in more crisis right now than femininity is. The subtitle of the movie is Violence, Manhood, and American Culture. So basically, this movie introduces a term, well, really, Tough Guys 1 did, but I don't show that one anymore because it's kind of outdated. That's why they remade it, because it has a lot of references to culture. And when you're talking about things like movies and TV and music and stuff, it's easy to become outdated. So they updated the movie with references you will know, because it's more from now. But I've been showing Tough Guys 1 for a long time now. Now they came out with Tough Guys 2 a couple years ago. But Tough Guys 1, coin this term, hypermasculinity. And so there's three questions I'm asking you to answer, be able to answer as you watch the video. What do they mean by hypermasculinity? What is that? They're also saying that it's a new form of masculinity. It hasn't always been around in American culture. It's a fairly new thing. And they're saying it didn't just come out of nowhere. It was constructed, a type of masculinity that's been constructed in American culture. So my question then is, what caused it? What are they saying were the causes of this new construction of masculinity? And then, what are the consequences? In other words, what problems does it cause for our society? You can guess from the title that violence might be one of the things they're going to talk about. And it is. But there's a range of other things that this movie says are connected with men's masculinity being a certain kind of masculinity that's constructed in American popular culture, like movies and TV and other things like that. So those are the three questions, and you'll need to watch not only today's part of the video, but uh, Wednesdays to fully be able to answer these questions. I'm not asking you to turn them in. I'm asking you to think about them. We'll discuss them. And then later on, when you get tested and have to write essays for the test and answer questions, uh, that's when this material will become more relevant to your grade. All right, are we clear then on what we're doing today and Wednesday? So you guys won't be coming on Wednesday. I'll come in and finish the rest of the video, but that means it's going to be on Canvas. And you'll have to go onto Canvas, go in your cave like they do, and watch your, the second part of the video. And I'm not presenting the movie as, go as gospel truth. It's an argument they're making, and I'm asking you to follow their argument. Not necessarily agree with it, but maybe you will agree with it. But you can also note criticisms you might have of it, or counterexamples. If you can think of popular culture or movies and TV shows that don't fit what they're talking about, 
By the way, there's quite a bit of graphic stuff in here. If you don't like obscenity or you talk of sexual, sexual things and stuff, then you might not want to watch this mass shooting in American history. Understand it later. Joining us, two young men apparently dressed in long black trench coats open fire at a high school just outside of Denver in Littleton, Colorado. When it comes to violence, it's almost like there are two Americas. It's horrific. I can't even put it, you can't put it into words. There's the America that recoils in horror whenever a brutal mass shooting erupts onto our television screens, shocked by the level of destruction and suffering that just a few individuals are capable of visiting upon so many innocent people. Police say that the gunman opened fire in a theater during a showing of that latest Batman movie, The Dark Knight Rises. And then there's the America that can't seem to get enough of violence as a form of entertainment and ritual, a seemingly endless appetite for ever-intensifying spectacles of all-out brutality and carnage. The question is what sort of relationship, if any, these two Americas have to one another. And if we're serious about answering that question, we need to stop chasing symptoms and take a good look at a truth that's been hiding in plain sight all along. That when we talk about violence in America, whether it's real or imaginary, we're almost always talking about violent masculinity. I'm Jackson Katz, and for more than 25 years I've been studying the causes of violence with a special focus on how cultural ideas about manhood contribute to interpersonal and relationship violence and also shape U.S. political culture. In addition to researching, writing, and lecturing about manhood and violence, I've worked on both a personal and an institutional level to engage men directly in the effort to prevent men's violence against women and children. My colleagues and I work closely with men from across the racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic spectrum in the sports culture, in the U.S. military, and in schools, colleges, and a variety of other settings. And as I've done this work, I've been consistently impressed by the thoughtful and sometimes courageous ways men are willing to confront the issue of men's violence when they actually have a supportive environment and a chance to talk about it. The reason I work with and focus on men is simple, because for the most part, violence is a men's issue. Whether we're talking about the horrifying, high-profile mass shootings we've seen over recent decades, the far greater rates of murder and gun violence we see on a day-to-day -day basis that barely register in the national news, or the epidemic of sexual and domestic violence, the vast majority of this violence is committed by men, young men, and boys. The statistics tell the story. 86% of armed robberies are committed by men. 77% of aggravated assaults are committed by men. 87% of stalkers are men. 86% of domestic violence incidents resulting in physical injury are perpetrated by men. 99% of rapes are committed by men. Men commit approximately 90% of murder. And over the past 30 years, 61 of the last 62 mass shootings have been committed by men. But while these numbers are striking, they rarely have ever come into play in mainstream discussions about violence. After every event like this, the questions always are the same. What causes this kind of a shooting? How can this happen? How can they be stopped? Look at media coverage of mass shootings. During hours and hours of exhaustive reporting, commentators seem to go out of their way to find gender-neutral ways to talk about this violence. The shooters in Aurora, the shooters in Newtown, the Connecticut shooter, the Aurora shooter, the alleged shooter, teenage psychopaths, mass murderers, the suspect, that kid, this punk, this murderer. The male perpetrators become shooters or murderers or assailants or killers or suspects or psychopaths and any number of other genderless beings. It's kids killing kids in the heart of America. Violence committed by boys becomes kids killing kids and youth violence. Here is a revealing and frankly horrifying picture of youth violence in America. It doesn't seem to matter that girls are kids and youth too, but only commit a fraction of these kinds of crimes. The issue gets framed as a kids issue and a problem with youth in general. And this baseline failure to acknowledge gender has a big effect when the discussion turns to other supposed causes of violence. Violence in the entertainment culture. Bloody games, gory movies, brutal TV shows. Call of Duty or Halo. Mental health issues, the faith issues. Autism or Asperger's syndrome. You're blaming the gun. Their mom and their dad. Substance abuse. Mental health, violent games, violent movies. Yeah. I want to blame Alex. the real culprit. Alex. Suicide pills. Alex. Mass murder pills. Okay, let me ask you Over and over again. We hear experts trying to explain violence in America by speculating about everything from guns and drugs and video games to dysfunctional families and even lead paint. But we hear very little, if anything, about why it is that girls and women also live in a culture saturated with guns and media violence, also suffer from mental illness, also come from dysfunctional families and have substance abuse problems, also live in houses with lead paint, yet don't commit anywhere near the amount of violence boys and men do. 
An article in the New York Times a while back provides a classic and typical example of how this kind of degendering works. It was this long piece that sifted through every possible theory trying to make sense of the wave of school shootings and in one parenthesis it said, all these shootings were done by boys. So you have a whole article trying to pull together all the different factors that might shed light on these shootings and the one that's maybe the most important ends up in parentheses. In other cases, the perpetrators disappear altogether. Violence against women. Violence against women. Violence against women. You see this a lot in the mainstream discussion about so-called violence against women. We call it violence against women as though nobody's actually committing the violence. Like it's something bad that just happens to women. Like the weather. They're just experiencing it. The fact that men are responsible for somewhere around 98% of this violence simply evaporates. We hear about women being harassed, abused, assaulted, or raped. Men are nowhere to be found. And the result of all this is that instead of seeing men's violence against women as a men's issue and taking a serious and sustained look at why it is that so many men are doing so much violence to women, we see it as a women's issue and focus most of our attention on how to help victims and survivors after the fact. And this has been true across the board. No matter what kind of violence is under scrutiny, there's been a systematic failure to focus on men as men. A failure all the more glaring given that mainstream media outlets have no problem at all taking gender seriously when women are the ones doing the violence. Are teenage girls involved in violent fights. A fight between two young girls breaks out on the playground. More and more teenage girls are getting involved in violent fights. When girls and women act out violently, their gender becomes the story. The same way race becomes the story with men of color. The horrific murder rate in Chicago. Does it have to do with guns or race? When men of color rape women or shoot people or blow things up, race and culture move to the forefront of the story. Is there a racial situation? Not necessarily. Crowding out the fact that the vast majority of the perpetrators under consideration, no matter what color they are, are men. All of this is partly a function of how dominant ideologies work linguistically to conceal the power of dominant groups. For example, when we hear the word race in the United States, we tend immediately to think about African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, South Asians. When we hear the term sexual orientation, we tend to think of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered people. And when we hear the term gender, we tend to think of women. In each case, the dominant group, white people, heterosexual people, men, don't get examined. As if white people don't belong to some racial grouping, as if heterosexual people don't have some sort of sexual orientation, as if men don't have a gender, in other words, we always focus on the subordinated group and not on the dominant one. And that's one of the ways that the power of dominant groups isn't questioned, by remaining invisible. And when it comes to masculinity, this invisibility often runs across the political spectrum. I'm here to open up an account. Okay, what type of account would you like? Um, yeah, I want the account where I can uh, get the uh, free gun. Okay. So in Bowling for Columbine, which is widely considered one of the definitive documentaries about gun violence in America, Left-wing filmmaker Michael Moore explores multiple reasons for America's continuing love affair with guns, including white fears of black crime, but somehow manages to avoid mentioning that the white people he focuses on throughout are overwhelmingly men. And on those rare occasions when the subject of men does make its way into mainstream discussions about violence, the conversation is usually less about men's identity than it is about their genes. There are young men involved in these things. There's a lot of testosterone there. What is it about the testosterone of being a young man that makes this come to this gun violence head so often? Why does it seem that these mass shooters are boys and not girls? Well, I think, you know what, I think there's probably some gender difference there. Uh, maybe there's some insulation uh, from, you know, things endocrine, whether it's the estrogen level or who knows what. But there's this common refrain that biology and evolutionary history are destiny, that men's violence is all about testosterone and our prehistoric role as hunter-warriors were just programmed to be violent. It really goes back to hunter-gatherer days. Yeah. And you hear another version of this in the common refrain, boys will be boys. Let boys be boys. They want to play rough, don't try and over-medicate them and, you know, turn them into girls. They're boys. A six-year-old boy goes like this, and he's suspended. And, and, and we end up having to talk about it because, you know, they just are unable to let boys be boys. And it all amounts to pretty much the same thing. Men's violence is somehow inevitable. We should just all throw up our hands and let the criminal justice system sort it out. One thing we, we can say for certain is, that is men are more violent than women. This is, a, this is a natural phenomenon. There's a close association between uh, hormonal balances and, and levels of violence. I think this is, this is fairly clear. No one would deny that there are biological factors that sometimes come into play with violence. 
The problem is when biological arguments lead people to conclude that men are just beasts who are overcome by hormonal urges they can't control. The area of the brain that's responsible for aggression is larger in general in men. And so men's na natural tendency is towards being aggressive. The fact is that human behavior is a product of a complex set of biological and environmental factors. And it's the height of male bashing to suggest otherwise, to imply that men are incapable of making moral and ethical decisions, that boys are born hardwired to bully, rape, and murder. But perhaps the most damaging thing this kind of thinking does is that it blinds us to the fundamental role that cultural systems play in all of this. This is a document signed by six of the major public health organizations saying that the violence in the entertainment, the level that we've attained to today, is causing increased aggressive behavior among some children. For decades, sure experts and government officials have been arguing that we need to take a closer look at the relationship between violence in the culture and violence in the real world. Does anyone disagree with that conclusion that uh, your violence in films propagates uh, uh, violent conduct on behalf of the children? This focus on the culture of violence in America took on new and bipartisan urgency in the wake of Adam Lanz's cold-blooded murder of 20 children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012. And in the days since the heartbreaking tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut, I also tasked the Vice President with leading an effort to come up with a comprehensive set of serious proposals to keep our children safe, including strengthening school safety, improving mental health care, and addressing a culture that too often glorifies guns and violence. But unfortunately, it quickly descended into a distracting and false debate between defenders of the gun industry and defenders of the entertainment industry. There exists in this country, sadly, a callous, corrupt, and corrupting shadow industry that sells and stows violence against its own people. Through vicious, violent video games, on one side, we've had the gun industry blaming movies and video games. We have blood-soaked films out there, like American Psycho, Natural Born Killers, that are aired like propaganda loops on splatter days, and every single day. On the other side of the debate, we've had the entertainment industry blaming the NRA and guns. Can we not do a better job on controlling the weapons of violence that get to the wrong hands? What both sides have failed to mention is how for years they've been mutually reinforcing parts of the same culture of violence and have profited handsomely from one another. We are here at the 2012 international photo shoot for Medal of Honor Warfighter. I'm here with Drake Clark from Magpul, a great partner. They brought CTRs, we got PMAGs, we got EMAGs. It's a dirty little secret that the video game industry and the Hollywood film industry get paid by the firearms industry to feature popular gun brands in their games and movies, and that the American military uses Call of Duty and other video games in their recruitment and training. Watch and learn. And the reason this matters so much is that while we've been debating whether guns or movies and video games are more to blame for violence, we've missed how both of these industries have combined to glorify not only violence, but a particular brand of violent masculinity. Awesome. The fact is that when we talk about a culture of violence in America, we're almost always talking about a culture of violent masculinity. And when we talk about a culture of violent masculinity, we're talking about what the culture teaches boys about what it means to be a man. We often talk about violence being a learned behavior, but it's more to the point to say that it's a taught behavior. And by shifting the focus from learned to taught, we shift the onus of responsibility onto those of us who are teaching our sons what it means to be a man. William Pollock introduced the idea of a boy code in which boys are taught from a very early age to act tough and not show their feelings. Michael Kimmel extended the reach of the boy code into late adolescence and young adulthood, where he describes a guy code in which young men police each other into conformity with dictates about manhood that come with an implicit and sometimes explicit warning. Don't slip up or you risk being unmasked and found out as someone who doesn't measure up. The result is that guys are put into a box that turns out to be the perfect breeding ground for violence. We can't show any emotion except anger. We can't think too much or seem too intellectual. We can't back down when someone disrespects us. We have to show we're tough enough to inflict physical pain and take it in turn. We're supposed to be sexually aggressive with women. And then we're taught that if we step out of this box, we risk being seen as soft, weak, feminine, or gay. Where in hell are you from anyway, Private? Sir, Texas, sir! Holy dog shit, Texas only steers and queers come from Texas, Private Cowboy. And you don't much look like a steer to me, so that kind of narrows it down. 
It may be an extreme case, but I don't think there's a guy out there who can't relate on a gut level to the excruciating scenes in the classic film Full Metal Jacket when Drill Sergeant Hartman goes to work driving basic human qualities out of the young recruits in order to turn them into men. You're so ugly you could be a modern art masterpiece. What's your name, fat body? Sir Leonard Lawrence, sir. Lawrence, Lawrence, what, of Arabia? Sir, no, sir. I don't like the name Lawrence. Only faggots and sailors are called Lawrence. From now on, you're Gomer Pyle. Sir, yes, sir. Anything short of full-scale emotional shutdown becomes a source of humiliation and shame. And in response, young men learn to adopt what I call the tough guys, the front so many young men put up to shield their vulnerabilities and avoid being ridiculed as pussies, punks, fags, and an endless list of other sexist and homophobic put-downs. Faggot. 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 Square. Fairy. Sissy. Bitch. 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 Homo. Pussy. 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 As sociologist C.J. Pasco details in her harrowing book, Dude, You're a Fag, the day-to-day -day humiliation boys and young men are subject to on a daily basis in our schools borders on criminal. Their every move relentlessly and brutally scrutinized for anything with even a whiff of femininity or weakness by peers that take it upon themselves to serve as gender cops. Are you calling stupid? <clears throat> no, I said gym class was stupid. No, I said gym class was Listen to this little faggot. But it doesn't just come from their peer groups. It comes from fathers, coaches, and older male role models as well who take it upon themselves to school young men in what it takes to measure up to a patriarchal ideology that says being a man is about domination, power, aggression, and control. Hit me. Come on, hit me. Come on. Come on, Jack. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. Come on. Come on. Hit. Here it is. Here it is. Hit it. Come on, son. Come on. Son, left. What are you doing? This was captured brilliantly in the Clint Eastwood film Grand Torino. Now you're just gonna learn how guys talk. How you doing, Martin, you crazy Italian prick? Who's the nip? Oh, he's a uh, pussy kid from next door. I'm just trying to man him up a little bit. Mm. You see, kid? Now that's how guys talk to one another. They do? Now go on out and come back in and talk to him like a man, like a real man. Eastwood's character, like so many fathers, father figures, coaches, and other men in boys' lives, assumes the role of the director and proceeds to evaluate how well the young man performs his role. What's up, you old Italian prick? What the hell are you doing? Have you lost your mind? But, but that's what you said. That's what you said men say. You, do, you don't just come in and insult the man in his own shop. What should I have said then? It ain't rocket science, for Christ's sake. It doesn't matter how unnatural, complicated, or ridiculous the role is, boys are expected to learn their lines and master the tough guys, or else risk being shamed as less than a man. Just turn around and go. A pair of animated films show very clearly how this process is passed down intergenerationally. It's a fish-eat-fish fish world. You either take or you get taken. In Shark Tale, the father shark explains to his son that violence is the way of the world. You, Lenny, you see something, you kill it, you eat it, period. Thanks. That's what sharks do. That's a fine tradition. What's the matter with you? Right here in front of me now, eat this. He then makes it clear to his son, who is a vegetarian, that he has no choice but to conform to shark norms and become carnivorous and aggressive. Frankie, I want you to take Lenny out, show him the ropes. Oh, come on, Pop. Son, you're gonna learn how to be a shark, whether you like it or not. I'm gonna kill you, Dragon. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut out your heart and take it to my father. I'm a Viking. I am a Viking! Similarly, in How to Train Your Dragon, the son of a Viking leader runs into problems when he refuses to act violently. And the unwillingness of the boy to use violence causes a crisis in his relationship with his warrior father. I don't want to fight dragons. <laughs> Come on, yes you do. Who can't even comprehend that his son might not want to follow in his violent footsteps. You're not a Viking. You're not my son. Qualities like compassion, caring, empathy, intellectual curiosity, fear, vulnerability, even love, basic human qualities that boys have inside them every bit as much as girls do, get methodically driven out of them by a sexist and homophobic culture that labels these things unmanly, feminine, womanly, and gay, and teaches boys to avoid them at all costs. And, most importantly, they're taught that real men turn to violence not as a last resort, but as the go-to method of resolving disputes and also as the primary means of winning respect and establishing masculine credibility.
The American ideal of the real man owes a lot to the Hollywood Western and the ultimate icon of white American masculinity, John Wayne. Young fella, if you're looking for trouble, I'll accommodate you. While other men talked a lot, thought too much, equivocated, and showed emotion, John Wade made the world bend to his will with just a stare, a few words, his fists, and his guns. I haven't lost my temper in 40 years, but Pilgrim, you caused a lot of trouble this morning. Might have got somebody killed, and somebody ought to belt you in the mouth. But I won't. I won't. The hell I won't. <laughs> You won't get away with the Cody. Cody, huh? You've got a good memory for names. Too good. And then there's Hollywood gangster films with cinematic tough guys like James Cagney and Humphrey Bogart. Don't move out of you, son. I'll fill your pants full of lead. Get over there. Men hardened by the world who knew the power of a few clipped words and a few rounds of ammunition. Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney. They, they teach me to talk. I like those guys. Come on. And this equation between toughness, manhood, and violence has continued and in many ways intensified over time. Say hello to my little friend! So in the wildly popular remake of the 1932 gangster film Scarface starring Al Pacino, it's all about the projection of toughness and the use of violence to achieve respect and success as a man. In this country, you've got to make the money first. Then when you get the money, you get the power. Then when you get the power, then you get the woman. Tony Montana's goal is to redeem his peasant childhood and his status as a Cuban exile by striking fear in others and becoming master of his own universe. Get him, Jesus! Get him! No! <laughs> and remorseless violence is the means to that end. Get you! The movie remains more popular today than ever, maintaining its cult status with young men across generations and racial and ethnic lines. <laughs> Some of our most cherished embodiments of tough guy masculinity are a collection of rogue cops, vigilantes, and glorified psychopaths who see a broken world of bureaucracy and inefficiency and unfairness around them and decide to take matters into their own hands. I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. And there's a whole range of other iconic representations of American manhood that regularly show up on popular lists of all-time greatest guy flicks. All of these films to a number, linking being a man with using violence or the threat of violence to command respect and achieve power. Uh -uh. There's Clint Eastwood as Dirty Harry dishing out justice at the end of the barrel of a long gun. You could ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Sylvester Stallone is John Rambo, killing his way through Vietnam to do the job our feckless American government is incapable of doing by bringing our POWs home. <laughs> Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? yippee ki motherfucker. Bruce Willis is John McClane restoring order to a disordered world in the Die Hard movies. Ah! Happy trails, Hans. Where are they? The Dark Knight doing battle against the psychotic, terroristic ruthlessness of the Joker. <laughs> and Ryan Gosling as a kind of post-apocalyptic John Wayne, setting out to save the town and the damsel in distress by visiting sociopathic rage and violence on anyone who gets in his way. <laughs> Running through all of this is the glorification of a kind of warrior masculinity that blurs the line between being a man and using violence to prove you're a man. Some directors have made a career out of this kind of thing. Mel Gibson has made a string of movies that amount to pageants of tough guy warrior masculinity, going so far as to turn Jesus Christ into the ultimate real man. Treating viewers to a two hour torture fest to drive the point home that Jesus was not just the prophet of peace and kindness, but tough enough to endure levels of pain that would put today's ultimate fighters to shame. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino's body of work can be read as a kind of tribute to the cinematic tradition of badass tough guys. From the stylized violence of Pulp Fiction to his rewrite of the American Western as a slave revenge tale. And 
we see the same glorification of violence as a legitimate tool for settling scores and expressing manhood, even in kids' movies. Peter said, get out of it! Peter's not king yet. Then, on a parallel track, you have the endless slate of films that glamorize male sexual aggression. Just stop being a pussy and nail her, okay? How do you not see the point? There's the point. There's the point. Okay. There's two more fucking points right there. A long-standing cultural narrative that says being a man is about sexual conquest. So did you bang her? Oh yeah, yeah, I banged her. That's what a man does, okay? The clear and deeply entrenched message to young men here, reinforced again and again over time, is that actually caring about girls and women is for pussies and fags. I need a little bit more time with Carly. There, I said it, okay? And I know you think that's lame, but can you please just give me one more day? That's not lame, bro. That's gay. The actual living, breathing humanity of girls and women matters a lot less than turning them into trophies to prove you're a real man and win the approval of your friends. Hollywood movies are one of the great teaching forces of our time. But it's not just movies. Look at violent video games, which provide guys with an immersive and interactive experience that allows them to master their environment and impose their will through violence. Or the rise of 24-7 internet pornography, a multi-billion dollar industry that sexualizes men's control and dominance over women. Look at popular men's sports that often seem to be less about healthy competition than about proving toughness through physical force and violence and dominating and humiliating the opposition. Look at the world of advertising, which sells products by exploiting men's anxieties about not measuring up. And look at our political culture, where the game is all about establishing your manly credentials by butching yourself up and methodically feminizing and taking apart the manhood of your opponents. And to those critics who are so pessimistic about our economy, I say, don't be economic girly man. What most discussions about violence miss is how pervasive and interconnected this larger story about manhood is, how it creates a kind of all-pervasive cultural script that says physical toughness, force, and violence are legitimate ways for men to achieve and maintain power and control, a script that men and boys are expected to adhere to whether they want to or not. Good morning. This is Randy Pion on K-Rez Radio, the voice of the Coeur d'Alene Indian Reservation. In the groundbreaking film Smoke Signals, one of the first features produced by Native Americans, there's this memorable scene where an older kid tries to teach a younger kid how to be a real-life Hollywood Indian. Don't you even know how to be a real Indian? I guess not. I guess I'll have to teach you then, ain't it? First of all, quit grinning like an idiot. Indians ain't supposed to smile like that. Get stoic. No, like this. You gotta look mean or people won't respect you. White people will run all over you if you don't look mean. You gotta look like a warrior. You gotta look like you just came back from killing a buffalo. But our tribe never hunted buffalo, we were fishermen. What? You want to look like you just came back from catching a fish? The same dances with salmon, you know? Thomas, you gotta look like a warrior. There, that's better. The scene is funny, but it also shows how the pressure to conform to ideals of violent masculinity cuts across racial, ethnic, and class lines. In fact, in a lot of ways, the pressure to conform is more acute among men whose power and identity are under threat in the real world from things like racism and growing economic inequality. As the sociologist Richard Majors has pointed out, African American and other men of color in urban areas often adopt a hypermasculine, menacing persona he calls the cool pose to signal that they're still men, regardless of what else has been stripped from them. This is also true with Latino men. Checkmate, puto who are disproportionately portrayed in Hollywood as gangbangers, Mexican drug lords, and thugs in the barrio. Images that are crude stereotypes, but which nonetheless have become symbols of toughness to some poor and working class Latinos whose manhood has been undermined by class exploitation and ethnic discrimination. And we see the same thing when it comes to Asian masculinity. I have a wonderful idea. Would you like to go to the dance with Sam? In American popular culture, Asian men have long been emasculated, stereotyped as ineffectual, desexualized, and unmanly. Uh, that the more better. I want my purse back. What? Your purse? That's not a purse, it's a satchel! It's a purse, okay?
but since the early 1970s, running counter to this long line of neutered stereotypes is the tough guy image of Bruce Lee and stars like Jackie Chan and Jet Li, who remasculinized the image of Asian and Asian American men with the highly stylized physicality and violence of the martial arts. But young Asian American men don't just have to look to Bruce Lee for cues. Increasingly, we've seen the phenomenon of Asian guys adopting the tough guy street styles of African American and Latino men to establish their masculine credentials. Hey, homie, I don't know what you had heard, but I ain't trying to act like no motherfucking black person, you know what I'm saying? This is me, this is all OG, this is all the original shit that you gonna get ever in your life. And this holds true for a lot of white guys as well. Oh, who, yo, I'm just flossing while those two hoes over there scratching that over. Who gets to knock the boots with me, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Many people have commented on the strange phenomenon of white suburban middle class kids acting black. Damn woman, why you gotta be such a raging bitch? Oh please listen to you. Look, there's a mirror right there. Why don't you take a look, okay? You're white. Middle class white boys may not have a lot of experience with the kind of real world inner city conditions that gave rise to the cool pose, but the culture tells them if they take on this black, urban, hard guy pose, they'll somehow be more real, more of a man. You happen to be white. I'm talking raised on Rapola Street white. Well, your mama used to drag you down to St. Casimir's just like all the other little piss pants on the block. What makes this even more interesting is that a lot of the very guys they see as models of authenticity are themselves projecting an image they picked up from the culture. <laughs> As the writer Nathan McCall has said, he and some of his African-American male cohorts got some of their ideas of manhood from The Godfather and other gangster films that featured tough, ruthless, white Italian gangsters. Someday, and that day may never come, I'll call upon you to do a service for me. But uh, until that day, accept this justice as a gift on my daughter's wedding day. One day, and that day may never come. I'm gonna call you to do something for me. Until then, take this justice as, as a gift. All right? Thank you, Godfather. And you hear the same kind of thing about Scarface. It's one of the hottest movies ever made. This is the all-time greatest movie. Never seen nothing like that. Nigga, that shit was a fucking Bible. I watched this movie 63 times. If you was a comic book lover, you love Batman. If you was out in the streets, you love Scarface. Say good night to the black guy. So we have this interesting phenomenon where we have white middle class males emulating poor urban black males who in turn are getting part of their idea about manhood from gangster films featuring white men who are playing Italian and Cuban American gangsters. Now are we made or are we made, man? The paradox is that the test of being real somehow comes down to how well you live up to a made up script. I got Scarface on repeat. Scarface on repeat. Constant, y'all. And it's a script that's only become increasingly violent over time. I'm hot! I'm big! All this began because it was time to push myself harder. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I gotta get a pump. That's it. It's good. It hurts. I know it does. That's it. Get it. There's no question that over the past few decades, there's been a ratcheting up of what it takes to be considered a real man. Look at our action heroes. In the 1950s, Superman was the equivalent of an ordinary guy running around in tights and a cape. And today, he's pumped up and ripped. Well, look at Batman. The body of Adam West as Batman in the 1960s is a far cry from the far more imposing Dark Knight of the 21st century. Pro wrestlers' bodies in the 1960s were more flabby. In the 21st century, they're way more sculpted, pumped up, and ripped. And look at toy action figures. If you look at the Star Wars toy figurines that kids played with in the 1970s and contrast them with the Star Wars toy figurines that are being marketed to kids today, you see a dramatic shift. Well, look at the body of G.I. Joe. A study done in the late 1990s found that over the past 50 years, the size of G.I. Joe's biceps, in real life equivalents, increased from 12.2 inches in 1964, to 15.2 inches in 1974, to 16.4 inches in 1994, and up to 26.8 inches by 1998. If you wanted a comparison to a real person, the biceps of someone like The Rock are reportedly only about 20 inches. Meanwhile, women have been taking up less symbolic space. 
Whereas full-figured women like Marilyn Monroe and Jane Mansfield represented ideal female beauty in the 1950s, today that ideal has become much smaller, thinner, younger, more girlish, and more waifish. Over the same time period, there's been a ratcheting up of violence itself. In the films of the 1950s and 60s, a few punches was all it took to establish a man's tough guy cred. Today, the level of brutality is like a different world. We've gone from the comparatively orderly sport of boxing to today's number one fighting sport, the street fighting viciousness of mixed martial arts and cage fighting. Oh! Wow! Hey, you kid. We are underway! This place is deafening! We've gone from iconic tough guys who armed themselves with pistols and the occasional machine gun in the 1940s to larger weaponry in the 1970s to the increasing militarization of these weapons in the 80s and 90s to the larger-than-life heavy metal killing machines we have today. You mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. Say hello to my little friend! We've seen video game violence go from the benign aggressions of Pac-Man, Space Invaders, and Asteroids to the unimaginable and hyper-realistic bloodbaths of today's game. And in a much more disturbing shift, we've seen porn culture go from the soft-core sexism of Hugh Hefner's brand of hedonistic masculinity in the 1950s to the hardcore misogyny, anger, aggression, and sexualized brutality of the men featured in the gonzo porn that is so popular with guys today. But despite this ratcheting up of violent masculinity, over the past few years we've been hearing exactly the opposite claim being made. Not that men are too violent, but that they've gone soft. The whole culture is being feminized, in my opinion. There's a certain emasculation that's happening in our culture. Part of the problem is we've sort of feminized schools. I think she's right. It's 100%. We're, we're yep. wuss wussifying America. Is this the wussification of America? Yes, this is one more step in the wussification of America. Is this the latest in the wussification of America? Right back. The heart of this argument is that men are in crisis because women, especially feminists and other forces of so-called political correctness, have been waging a full-scale war on traditional manhood. We've been so emasculated by a so-called women's movement at this point. Even our strongest men are acting girly. The founding fathers were men, not wussies. It's the wussification of America that's killing us! Now, there's no doubt we're in the throes of some kind of a crisis in masculinity. There's rightfully been a lot of attention paid in recent years to how boys are lagging behind girls in our schools, how men are experiencing heightened job insecurity and alienation in the global economy, and how more and more men seem to be lost and acting out violently and self-destructively. But rather than questioning whether it's our inability to move beyond the straitjacket of traditional masculinity that might be the source of this crisis, across the cultural and political landscape there's been a growing movement to reclaim and reassert traditional manhood. We need to toughen up and stand up for ourselves and learn to be uh... Uh, a lot tougher than uh, yoga is going to teach us to do all by ourselves. From the recent avalanche of books and magazines celebrating throwback modes of manhood, to the wave of reality programs obsessed with the kind of manly physical labor that in real reality has been disappearing with America's manufacturing base over the past three or four decades. Eat, sleep, carve. It's what we do. Whatever happened to men? to the never-ending barrage of hyper-masculine sexist ads full of men obsessed with proving their manhood. So keep the reality TV and lady drinks. We're good. Dr. Pepper 10, it's not for women. And shot through with borderline hysteria about the possibility of being perceived as feminine. Uh, light beer, please. Sure. Do you care how it tastes? Nah, I don't care how it tastes. Okay, well, when you start caring, put down your purse and I'll give you a Miller Lite. It's a carry-all. No, it's not. Man up. There was no clearer depiction of this backlash phenomenon than the film Fight Club. Like so many others, I had become a slave to the IKEA nesting instinct. Uh, yes, I'd like to order the Erica Picari dust ruffles. Please hold. 
The movie portrayed the emasculation of young men by the consumer culture. We're still men. Yes, we're men. <laughs> men is what we are. And offered up bare-knuckled violence as a way for men to reclaim their manhood. Regardless of whether we see this film as a glamorization or a satire of backlash masculinity, to a lot of young men it has served as a model of manhood, as backyard fight clubs have proliferated in the years since the film's release. We're witnessing a culture in retreat, a narrative that tells men that the best way to respond to change is not to adapt, but to reclaim traditional masculine control and dominance from the forces of feminization. And as it turns out, this is an old pattern in American history. As the scholar Jane Tompkins has shown, the Western dime novels of the late 1800s and early 1900s that helped create the romantic myth of the Wild West, burnishing the idea of a real man as a rugged individualist armed and ready to defend himself at a moment's notice, were themselves a direct response to women's challenges to men's dominance and control. According to Tompkins, it's no coincidence that Westerns became popular at the exact moment the frontier was closing, men's work was moving inside factory walls, and women were organizing a temperance movement to get men out of bars and force them to take responsibility for their families, and also beginning to agitate for their right to vote. The saloons and violence of the dime novels of the Old West provided an imaginary refuge for men who were threatened by a shifting economic landscape and the prospect of women's equality, a fantasy world that could help them shore up their increasingly anxious masculinity. And you see these same foundational anxieties at the heart of yet another iconic example of traditional masculinity, the Boy Scouts. Boy Scouting is one of the few institutions to balance the rather softening effect of our modern way of life. Which, for all its virtues as an organization, has made headlines in recent years for refusing to allow gay kids to become scouts. A lot of people who don't want their kids to go camping, you know, out deep into the woods for days on end with guys who are avowed open uh, gays. The Boy Scouts are looked to with nostalgia today as a throwback to simpler, more traditional times, untouched by change and the forces of equality. But here again, the past turns out to be more complicated than it seems. I will do my best to do my duty to God and the King. It turns out that Lord Baden-Powell, a highly decorated officer in the British Army, founded the Boy Scouts as an organization of paramilitary socialization in 1908 for a very explicit reason, to counteract what he perceived as a decline in the manly virtues due to the growth of urban industrial culture, the increase in women's education and calls for women's suffrage, and the emergence of homosexuality for the first time as a recognized category of human sexuality. In his influential book, Rovering to Success, A Guide to Young Manhood, Powell was quite explicit about this. God made men to be men, he wrote. Civilization, with its town life, buses, hot and cold water laid on, everything done for you, tends to make men soft and feckless beings. We badly need training for our lads if we are to keep up manliness in our race, instead of lapsing into a nation of soft, sloppy cigarette suckers. Building on and borrowing from Baden-Powell's ideas, the Boy Scouts of America was founded in 1910 for the same reason, to reassert traditional ideas of masculinity in the face of social change. The Scout program is designed to help our sons, cousins, and younger brothers develop the initiative, the resourcefulness, the character, the quick thinking, and the leadership they really need in the somewhat jittery, insecure world in which we live. Again and again at key moments in American history, you see men reacting to change in just this way by retreating into a hyper-masculine fantasy world. You see it in the rise of popular men's magazines in the 1940s, filled with stories about breathtaking manly adventures, sports, and sex. These magazines may look retro to us today, but what's important to remember is that they were just as retro in their own time. As the lives of men grew more sedentary during the consumer boom of the post-war years, as women moved into the workplace in unprecedented numbers and the women's movement gained traction, these magazines offered men a way to hit back at what Ralph Day, the editorial director of True Magazine, describes as the perils of creeping equality. Men were turning to his magazine in unprecedented numbers, Day explained to a group of men in a speech, because it stimulates his masculine ego at a time when man wants to fight back against women's efforts to usurp his traditional role as head of the family. In other words, these hypermasculine fantasies and images were explicitly designed to keep alive the traditional equation between masculinity, dominance, and control at a time of democratization and change.
And this backlash has only accelerated exponentially since the 1960s when the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian equality movements, and the anti-war movement rose up to challenge traditional masculine authority like never before, especially the authority of straight white men. And these struggles unleashed a fierce cultural and political backlash that has sought to reassert the traditional order by reasserting traditional manhood. On the political front, no figure has been more important to this project of regressive national remasculinization than President Ronald Reagan. Reagan, a former Hollywood actor and matinee idol, rose to political power opposing all the progressive gains of the 1960s and 70s. The plain truth of the matter is this has to stop and it has to stop like the day before yesterday. He led the fight against every major piece of civil rights legislation, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian liberation movements, and the student movement that opposed the war in Vietnam. I was picked at a few days ago in California by some youngsters that had signs that said make love, not war. Trouble is they didn't look like they were capable of doing either. The fellow that was doing the talking had a haircut like Tarzan, he walked like Jane, and smelled like Cheetah. And when he ran for president in 1980, he proved to be a master of political symbolism, tapping deep into the myth of the American cowboy, presenting himself as a throwback version of the strong, silent type riding into town to rescue a country emasculated by the equality movements of the 60s and the weak leadership of President Jimmy Carter. John Wayne wasn't available, Ronald Reagan was the next best thing. And the manly image of rugged individualism Reagan mobilized to turn people against the government and eviscerate the social safety net in the 1980s has been kept alive by his proud political heirs today. Well, one of the, one of the objectives of the feminazis over the last 20, 25 years has been to dominate the public education system so as to remove the competitive nature of boys. I mean, there's a crisis of, of young man-boy education in the schools. And they did this on purpose, to eliminate male competition in the workforce. This is part of Feminazi Grand Plan. Talk radio hosts like Rush Limbaugh wield huge influence in the American political culture, especially with white men who have been fleeing the Democratic Party in droves since the 1960s and voting Republican. And one of the primary ways he's achieved this success is by appealing to white men as victims of the feminist movement. These kinds of women who have been attacking testosterone, who have been attacking traditional male roles, to whom the idea of a real guy is some metrosexual. To the older working and middle class white men who make up the bulk of Limbaugh's audience, the message is clear. The anxieties you're feeling have nothing to do with things like structural economic change or corporate greed or rising inequality. Your problems are somehow the result of women and people of color and gay people and liberals of all types undermining the country's values and taking away your manhood. Watch, it's a bunch of metrosexuals. I mean, these are they're a bunch of guys. You wouldn't want one of them in a foxhole with you. Rush Limbaugh, like so many of his colleagues in the right-wing talk radio universe, may have dodged the draft in Vietnam by claiming that an anal boil rendered him unfit for service. And he may have lived for years in the liberal epicenter of New York City in an $11 million penthouse apartment decorated like a 16th century French chateau. But all that matters is that he talks tough and plays a real man on the radio. But Limbaugh is just the most public face of an increasingly toxic strain of masculine paranoia and victimization. You think you're a tough guy? L l have me back with a boxing ring in here, and I'll wear red, white, and blue, and you can wear your Jolly Roger. Okay. Talk radio hosts like Alex Jones have become heroes to their largely white male audiences by stoking fears of masculine dissolution. The reason there's so many gay people now is because it's a chemical warfare operation. I have the government documents where they said they're going to encourage homosexuality with chemicals so that people don't have children. I even catch my Myself, Bob, drinking out of these estrogen uh, mimickers. Because after you're done drinking your little juices, well, you, I mean, you're, you're, you're ready to go out and have a baby. You're ready to put makeup on. You're ready to wear a short skirt. You're ready to go, uh, you know, uh, put together a, you know, a garden of roses or something. You're ready to put lipstick on. Look, I mean, look at this. And at the base of all of this is the belief that the best way for men to restore their dwindling manhood and restore order is through what the cultural historian Richard Slotkin has called the frontier myth of regenerative violence. Most people understand that guns make you safer, uh, especially because society is degenerating. There's going to be a lot of craziness going on. And so we need guns to protect ourselves. What this shows is that a whole lot of men out there fear they're losing control and are convinced that violence might be the only way left for them to protect what's theirs. The most powerful nation in the world and I think it's crazy looking at all these armed Americans and our resolve 
and dealing with things and how despite all that there's still people crossing our borders why the hell are you people on the borders not firing at these people shooting them and dealing with them that's the thing that gets me if i lived on the border and some brown man came running through my backyard that looks like he didn't belong there i'm gonna fire some tracers at his ass so why, why aren't people doing that the basic idea is that the best way to regain power and control is through a barrel of a gun or as many guns as possible. They're accurate. Mm -hmm. They are dependable. Yes, they are. Super dependable. They are extremely well made. You can carry plenty of them right. on your person right. at all times. A recent study on gun ownership in America by the Institute of Medicine and the National Research Council made headlines when it found that there are somewhere around 300 million guns in America, or roughly one gun per citizen, as much as half of all the civilian-owned guns in the world. But what received less attention was that nearly two-thirds of these guns are owned by just 20% of the population, that older white men living in rural areas own most of these guns, and the number one reason for owning guns has shifted over the past few years from hunting and recreation to protection and self-defense. Our leaders don't get it. And that's why you're going to need all the help you can get. That's why you need to be prepared. This white male paranoia and siege mentality have fueled the increasingly aggressive effort to block even the most sensible gun policies. When the system is overwhelmed, and I mean the system on the entire planet, somebody had better be prepared to protect themselves, their families, their neighborhoods, and the freedom of all mankind. Never let them take your Second Amendment right, ever. This siege mentality has also fueled the rise of hate groups and militias over the past quarter century. They're not branches of Al-Qaeda. They're right-wing extremists with lots of guns and an ax to grind against the U.S. government. Listen, people. Things are bad. Things are real bad. And it's going to get a lot worse. So basically, if people need to wake up, Start buying some of these, see? Groups like these are often described as white supremacist hate groups, which they usually are. But they can also be seen as a kind of reactionary men's movement, an organized expression of white male anxiety and aggrieved entitlement that relies on violence as the preferred means of attaining its goals. Recovery crews are still searching the waters around an island where a gunman opened fire on young people attending a summer camp. In recent years, perhaps the most disgusting and morally bankrupt expression of this kind of threatened entitlement was the massacre of 77 people, including 69 teenagers, perpetrated by the Norwegian right-wing fanatic Anders Breivik, a former customer service representative who had been declared unfit for service in the Norwegian army. In his 1,500-page manifesto explaining his reasons for the attack, Breivik ranted against Islam and multiculturalism, but he reserved special venom for feminism's role in emasculating Western men. According to Breivik, Feminist ideology and political correctness have been responsible for transforming a patriarchy into a matriarchy and intend to deny the intrinsic worth of native Christian heterosexual males. And by now, men have been reduced to an emasculated, touchy-feely subspecies. But this isn't just about extremists who stockpile weapons. All too often, a similar logic is at work with a lot of the violence committed by ordinary guys. Can you open this, please? Oh, sure. Thank you very much. So what, you have a, uh, you like the bitches out there in the uh, fucking uh, old Russia there? Wow. The bitches in the old Russia. The what the man of the, the women. It's the fucking hoes, baby. The fucking girls. <laughs> you Watch the rest on Wednesday if we can. So, uh, any thoughts on the movie yet? We'll let the argument uh, finish out before we talk about critiquing it, but I did want to suggest that some of what's happening right now in our uh, presidential campaign is, I think, related to what they were just talking about. Um, people in the, I mean, I'll let you draw your own conclusions about Trump himself. What kind of masculinity does he project and does he say is a real man? Uh, and, and what are his criticisms of why we shouldn't allow a woman to be president. But right now, some of his followers are saying if, uh, that this whole, erect, this whole election is rigged, and if, sh if she wins, they're not going to accept the result, and they're talking about armed resistance to the government. So I'm just trying to get you to see. I mean, that's one of the claims of this movie, is that men have been 
taught that you're not being a real man somehow if you don't have guns and aren't, and that the people who you know don't agree with you are trying to take your guns and take away your masculinity. And so I, I'll leave it to you which side you're going to agree with, but I think it's interesting that this movie was made a couple years ago and we're seeing right now a lot of what they're saying, that there's these very angry men in America that support the candidate that looks like they're going to lose and some of them are talking about violence as the way to solve that problem. So that's uh, maybe the stakes of what we're talking about here. I mean, it's a little misleading to watch the movie because they're talking about a lot of TV shows and movies and it may seem like that's all we're talking about is like, should we go see How to Train Your Dragon or not? But I think the stakes are larger in trying to talk about, well, the kind of men we think we are in America dictates the kind of behavior we're going to have. And are we going to have a peaceful democracy where we disagree and vote on things? Or are we going to have a violent, you know, jungle where we kill each other when we disagree? And it's all about who's got more guns and who's got the bigger muscles. If that's the kind of country we're having, then, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you agree with that or not. but. Those are the, uh, just a little scary to me, the uh, way some of these guys are talking here at the end of the movie about why gun, you gotta have guns, you gotta be ready to shoot you know, the government. And some of that is, you know, already goes on in America and may be happening again. So, um, but my plea as a, uh, as a representative of the college situation is we're all here to develop our minds and you know, smart thinking and good talking is the way to resolve disputes that people may have rather than just who's the bigger, stronger guy. And to me, that's like a dumb, mindless, animalistic way of solving your problems. And so, you know, you can decide yourself who you think should be running things in our country. But for a long time, we've believed in intellect and the pen being mightier than the sword, mightier than the sword and all those things. So when you hear voices saying, we got to be ready to use the Second <coughs> Amendment, got to be ready to use violence to solve our problems, and that violence is the only way to solve our problems, you know, I don't know where that comes from, but this movie suggests it comes from a certain kind of masculinity. And if that's the case, we can ask whether you know that's the only way for men to be men or not. And what kind of men we want American men to be. All right, well, we will have some of those conversations on Wednesday and other conversations about the future of this country. And I, you'll have to watch this rest of the video yourself and be able to answer these questions.